Our next presentation in this session is by Anna Frankenberg Garcia from the University of Surrey. And the topic is Corpus Examples for Writers. Over to you, Anna. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Corpus Examples from, for Writers. This is the University of Surrey. It's, if you don't know, it's in a little town called Guildford. It's 40 minutes away from London to the southwest of London. Very nice. Okay. Um, in the past, dictionaries didn't have examples, and learners use dictionaries mostly to look up definitions, spellings, and translations in the case of bilingual dictionaries. Today, however, uh, there are lots of learners' dictionaries around, and they try to help learners with language production as well. Um, this encoding information in dictionaries and in, uh, information for language production can be presented in several different ways in dictionaries. I'm giving here an example for a proof. So uh, some dictionaries use syntactic codes like this. Some dictionaries use syntactic information which is spelled out in words like this, or like this, or like this. Some dictionaries give syntactic patterns embedded in definitions, uh, like the co-build style of definition. Then you also have examples, and then all big dictionaries today seem to give examples. And one dictionary also gives explanations alerting to common errors, like this. And then, of course, uh, many dictionaries often employ a combination of more than one method to help learners with language production. Okay, but the next important question, do learners actually use dictionaries when they are writing? Um, and the answer is, well, not really. Uh, in an early uh, research, you can see here, French learners of English did not tend to use any dictionary information on syntactic patterns. A um, bit later, uh, in Germany, even teachers did not know dictionaries contained information on syntactic patterns. And uh, recently, with an experiment, I did asking students, where would you look this up? A very specific question, where would you look up how to use this word in this context? Only a minority of Portuguese undergraduates would turn to a dictionary to find the answer. And the answer was there in the dictionary, but they say, oh, a grammar book or something. They would be lost. Okay, but then you have also a number of experiments of what uh, students do when they're asked to do Look, use dictionary. So go and look this up in a dictionary. So where do they look up this information for language production? And most uh, studies point towards this. This is what learners seem to prefer. They seem to look for dictionary uh, uh, information for production, preferably in examples. Okay, so learners like examples. But not all examples in dictionaries can help writing. Uh, some examples in dictionaries are primarily decoding examples. And you can see here in this example here that survived the massacre plus death can give you a hint of what feigning might mean. So you can sort of deduce the meaning from the context. Some examples are primarily encoding examples and here, in this example, I, I wouldn't be able to guess what catering meant here. Um, it could mean a series of things. But you can see here um, that you must use the preposition for after catering. So I would say this is a primarily encoding example. And then, of course, you have some examples that actually do the two things at once. This is an example here. 
So uh, previous supporters and stopped together can give you a hint of what believing might mean. And also it's an intransitive verb in this sense. So you can spot the preposition in after believing. So it's also encoding. Um, now, there are not many encoding and decoding examples, but this is not really a shortfall of dictionaries. The thing is that uh, it, it, you don't find these examples in corpora uh, uh, either. Um, simply because people, um, they don't always give contextual clues about words, what words mean when they employ them. Uh, so you really have to look for these examples. Anyway, uh, dictionaries also offer the, opposition, uh, the, the, the possibility of looking for further examples. So you, you can often click for more examples. Uh, especially, you know, now in e-dictionaries where space is not a problem anymore. Uh, but do learners actually click on them? And I would love to have log files for that, uh, but I don't know. Uh, and are these extra examples actually helpful? Um, well, you can see from the above five, there are five examples from the Longman examples bank, the first five. They're not really sorted according to senses. So you have two different senses of uh, approve mixed up here. And they're also not sorted according to transitivity. So you have examples both for approve of and for approve direct object. So if you look at those, they can really be as hard to interpret as raw corpus data. The only thing is that you don't need to go to a corpus, but the examples are there. Anyway, previous studies in, on dictionary examples for language production, they didn't um, disclose much evidence about their value. And I don't think it was very surprising in the light of what I said before. Um, first, um, examples to facilitate production have to illustrate the target grammar or the target collocation the learner is looking for. And if they don't do that, they can't help in language production. Uh, and real dictionary examples don't always do. Um, and then these early studies, another problem was that they were based on words that were unfamiliar to the subjects. And writers don't normally use words that they don't know when they're writing. They already know the word, but they want to know how to use them in context. And then, so in these early studies, I think the comprehension factor may have been an intervening variable. So you were not just measuring language production. Um, so, okay, then uh, I decided to revisit these studies and I carried out two recent studies on examples, one in 2012, one in 2014. And if you came to my presentation in Tallinn, the, I presented the 2014 uh, study, so I'll go over very quickly here. Um, instead of actual uh, dictionary examples, what I did in those studies is I separated encoding and decoding examples. I picked them up from corpora and I made a distinction between the two. And um, in the language production test, I'm not gonna talk about the comprehension test, I'm, only interested in production now for this presentation. But in the language production test, only encoding examples focusing on the target syntax or collocation were used. And then I also used test words, not unknown words to the, uh, to the users, uh, to the participants, because I didn't want that to intervene with their performance, but I used words that I knew they could understand. They were all in the Oxford 3000, but they were tricky to use. I knew Portuguese learners of English had problems employing these words in context. Um, the results for these studies were in the 2012 study, the encoding examples always helped and multiple encoding examples helped more than just one example. In the 2014 study, one encoding example was not enough, but multiple encoding examples did help. So why? Okay, one possible reason were the different populations. In the 2012 studies I was working with undergraduates, but some of them were not very mature. And in the 2014 studies I worked with secondary school students, some of whom were pretty mature. So I don't think that was the main reason why I got different results. I think the main reason was the elicitation procedure, and this can affect your results quite substantially. Um, in the 2012 study, it was an error correction text, so the students were actually 
trying to spot the errors, and they were looking in the examples to see, look for errors in, in the error correction text. And in the 2014 task, uh, it was a translation task, and the translations looked very easy. They involved words the students were familiar with, but they weren't so easy after all. So I think the students may not have looked at the examples very carefully because they didn't think they needed the examples. Okay, so what we know so far, examples are not the only source of information for writers, but writers seem to prefer examples over other sources of information. Um, dictionary examples are not always aimed at language production, but selected examples with a target collocation or syntax can be effective, especially if learners are made aware of their reference needs, if they know there's something wrong with their own production, and especially if more than one example is supplied. So in this study, what did I want to do? Um, it's a follow-up to my previous studies, and I wanted to further explore examples for writers. I'm not interested in examples for comprehension because you can also get definitions and translations. There are other ways where you can uh, access comprehension. But for writing, for language production, examples seem to be very important. In particular, I wanted to refine my elicitation procedure. I was not happy with my previous elicitation procedures. I wanted to make it better. I didn't want an error correction test, and I actually wanted to encourage the students to consult the examples rather than think, oh, I don't need that, this translation is so easy. Okay, I also wanted to use a larger sample. In my previous studies, I used just 48 participants from two undergraduate classes in one university, and then 50 participants from two secondary school classes. This was a, these were small groups. I wanted to use a larger sample. And I also wanted to test whether there was an optimum number of examples to give to learners. In my previous studies, I gave students just one or exactly three examples. But would they benefit from two examples? What about four? So I wanted to look at that too. Method. Okay, I worked with 161 undergraduates. Uh, they were Portuguese in Portugal. They were not language or linguistic students, as often happens in these studies. They were just uh, students studying tourism, hotel management, marketing, business, and they all had to take uh, two, uh, two hours of English per week. Um, the students were divided into five groups, four experimental, one control. Um, I gave a pre-test partial translation task uh, to all groups. Uh, task was the same, and then for each experimental group there was a differentiated treatment, which I will let you, uh, explain next. Control group, no treatment. And then there was this post-test translation revision task. So this is what the uh, pre-test looked like. Um, so they had a, a sentence uh, in Portuguese, é a primeira vez que vem esse restaurante. And then uh, they had to complete with a, a part of the translation was given, and they, they have to fill in the, the rest. So uh, this is uh, the target error, what I expected, the typical error they Portuguese speakers do. They use the present here, probably because of uh, influence from the Portuguese. This is the target structure uh, with the present perfect. So this is another example. A piscina tem 20 metros de comprimento. Okay, this is the target, uh, the typical error that many Portuguese speakers do. And this is the target structure. Again, another example. A prova o trabalho do presidente. Target, uh, well, typical error and target structure. This is another one. Eles nunca confiaram em nós. This is the typical error in Portuguese. Trust is intransitive, so you need a preposition there. Uh, and this is the target structure. Okay, um, th these are just the first four uh, sentences in the test. There were 10 sentences in all. The, the, the students did this test in test conditions and with a green viral for reasons that I will explain next. Okay, uh, treatment. The green virals were collected. 
So if you ever need a, a green viral, I have a collection <laughs> of them at home. Um, then the students, all students were told that their pretest translations were prone to errors and they were asked to reassess the translations they had just done. The control group uh, had to do that without consulting any references. Then the experimental groups, each group received from one to up to four examples. So for example, group one received just this, and here you can see that it's a similar sentence using the present perfect. This group two received two example sentences, group three, group four. All sentences had vocabulary within the Oxford 3000, so the students, they were sort of uh, B1, uh, B2 students, they were expected to know these words, or they were cognates of Portuguese, so even if they were outside Oxford 3000, they were also expected to know these words. So comprehension should be an issue here. Okay, and then they had to supply a new translation in different color ink. And the reason for supplying a, a, using different ink was so that they couldn't cheat and they couldn't correct the, the one they gave before. They had to really make a difference between the pretest translation and the post-test translation. Okay, so um, they had done this wrong and uh, hopefully they would be able to improve it the second time. Okay, note on the elicitation procedure in the 2012 study, it lacked a bit of ecological validity because the students were actively trying to spot errors they might even not have committed in the first place. In the 2014 study, the students were unaware that these deceptively easy sentences were error prone, so they may not even l have looked at the examples given to them. Um, so in this study, I asked the students to reassess their own initial translations after telling them that there might be something wrong. And the st students were thus encouraged to actually read the examples that were given to them. Okay, marking procedure. The uh, tests were marked item by item to ensure consistency that I marked them all in the same way. Uh, one point was given to each correct target structure. Variations in the target structure were accepted. Errors unrelated to the target structure were disregarded, like spelling mistakes. And partial corrections were given half marks. It, this only happened with this test item and I didn't really know what to do because they corrected the has and turned it into is, but they, some students forgot to add long at the end of the sentence, uh, also half a mark. Okay, so each test was assigned a pretest and a post-test grade, and these are my uh, results for the pretest. Now, I'm gonna walk around, I have the microphone. Um, you can see here um, that the, pre te the test was really good. Look at the medians, they all scored really low out of 10. So I really managed to get sentences that were causing them trouble. Translations that looked easy but were very difficult. Okay, but then if you look at the ranges, you can see a wide range here. One student in the control group achieved nine out of 10. And I consider him to be an outlier. Um, here in this group too, one student managed to score nine. There were actually two students who did very well in the pretest, and one student in here, group three, who actually get, had full marks in the pretest. So I saw uh, these students, they're not good for my experiment. I have 161 students. I'm going to dismiss them. So I, I dismissed these outliers because there was no really much room for improvement, and I worked with 157 participants. Now here you can see that the median was all very low, one, and, you know, reasonable ranges. And now the post-test, um, post-test scores, and you can see here um, that they all, not the control group didn't improve, but all the others improved quite a lot, especially the group with three examples. There's also quite a lot of range if you look at that. So a lot of learner variability here. So did the examples help? Well, um, here I'm comparing the pretest and post-test differences. And you can see here that for the control group, uh, just telling the participants that 
to reassess the translations was not helpful, it was even counterproductive. Some students managed to make their translations worse by two points, okay? But all the other groups seem to improve um, their uh, translations with the ones using examples. And um, I uh, compared with a pre-test, post-test Wilkinson sign rank test. I did not use a matched t-test because the data was not normally distributed. So I prefer this. And all groups except the control improved. Then, how many examples helped most? Um, well, uh, I only wanted to compare the experimental groups here. So, um, I again applied, uh, uh, I thought the three examples group was helping more, but I applied again a non-parametric test instead of an ANOVA, again because the data was not normally uh, distributed. And to my great disappointment, the difference in the number of examples was not significant. I was really disappointed. I thought, oh, I'm going to throw all this data in the bin. But then I decided, well, no, this is, I have to be true, and this is science, and I have to report my results. <laughs> anyway, um, conclusion. Uh, just telling students that their translations were prone to errors did not lead to any improvement. It was even perhaps counterproductive. But supplying encoding examples, focusing on the target structure helped. The students in the experimental groups were able to correct their own translations in general, improve them a lot. Uh, the number of examples given, however, did not make a significant difference. So why? Why? What's happening? Yeah, and this is, uh, and it, so it was not possible to assert an optimum number of examples. Why? Anyway, I think there was a lot of individual learner difference here. And you can see from the ranges, well, some students were able to improve 10 points or 9 points. Others improved zero. Also, I think some target structures may require more examples than others. Uh, for example, if it's just a case of a missing preposition, maybe it's easier to spot than a case where the students have to change the tense, like from the simple present to the present perfect. So, um, I don't know. So, further research. Um, I think we need further research in learners' individual needs and preferences. Also, in which structures require more examples, not all uh, structures may require the same number of examples, but most importantly, how learners can access the right kind of examples when these examples are needed. Because learners don't go to dictionaries and they don't get spoon-fed these examples like I did in my highly controlled experiment. So the main thing is to give them this information when they need them. So now you know what the topic of my next ELEX presentation <laughs> is going to be about. Um, if you want more details about this study, uh, it just came out in IJL. And uh, let me know if you want a, a copy. These are the dictionaries I used. These are other references. And thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. We have some time for questions before the coffee break. Did, did you vary the number of examples over participants, or did one participant always get for all the items the yeah, same number? Of, it, cause yeah, you, cause maybe I had, you could vary that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had 30 participants in each group, around 30. I thought it was enough, and it would be too complicated procedurally to vary. I was not... Um, giving the tests myself, yeah. I had to, I had other lecturers, English lecturers, giving the tests. It would overcomplicate yeah, okay. the experimental but design. Since, since you're so, and I think just, justly so, concerned about individual differences, if you would vary them, um, you could use mixed effects, the regression models, with items and uh, students as random effects. Yeah, so to, yeah, to pinpoint whether it's specific. Um, whether it's dependent on specific Yeah, so maybe that's the follow-up now, yeah. now that I know that the main thing was learner difference, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or useful suggestions? 
Doctor. Hi, I wonder uh, whether a collocational pattern given in given in the dictionary would be as well a help for some uh, uh, cases as a full-fledged example. And for yeah. example, we provide uh, a collocational pattern and then examples. And uh, typically we avoid to uh, repeat the collocational structure in the, in the example, but I'm not yeah. sure whether well, this is the right strategy. Should, yeah, you should ask Anna here, who, did, uh, who wrote an entire book about this. <laughs> Uh, about uh, all the other information in dictionaries comparing uh, syntactic patterns uh, and, and that. Um, I wanted to focus only in, on examples, but um, if you read Anna's book, sorry to advertise well, <laughs> um, uh, you will find your answer there, I think. And <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I have a remark. I'm thinking about perhaps more real-life experiment of providing the students access to a corpus, whether they could improve <laughs> something just by being able to look for something in a corpus. Um, yeah, you have SCALE now, the SCALE corpus, sketch engine for English language learners. I think uh, that may help, yes. Um, Oh, mm -hmm. There's coffee break coming up, but since there's no other talks, if someone else would like to ask a question, I think we can still fit in. No questions? Well, thank you very much again. Thank you. And <laughs> go to coffee.